Good evening. There we go. Happy Thursday. Hope you had a blessed day. I had a blessed day, and I'm glad to be here with you again. I thought, thought tonight, to be honest with you, it's one that I feel like is more so for me than it is for you. And I really believe that it's almost like an extension from last night's message. Last night we talked about the idea of gaining victory in Christ. How did Jesus do it? And we looked at some of the principles that, that Jesus used in his life, his dependence upon God, uh, uh, shunning evil, and also uh, just, just Jesus' uh, devotion to his Father. And there was one text that came to mind. I want to read it to you before we pray. It's in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8 and verse 29, the Bible says this. Jesus says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Our message tonight is entitled, The Atheist Christian. The Atheist Christian. Let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, you know that how much I need you tonight, how Jesus was so dependent upon you for everything. Lord, I'm dependent upon you once again. We are dependent upon you once again. And I ask you to do a miracle for us, that you'll take the meager loaves that we have and that you would multiply them to each and every one of us. We ask these gifts and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you might guess, you probably think, what, does, what is the idea of this topic tonight, the atheist Christian? What I really want to get at is that there, is, there was one quote that inspired this entire message. In fact, if I could just read that quote alone, this message could be done. It could be finished. But there's some thoughts that I want to bring out from the Word of God as I started to think about this quote and what it did in my life, it helped to, to change my thinking in relationship to God. <clears throat> I'm going to read you that quote tonight, but before we get to that, we're going to have to look at what does it mean to be an atheist. So I'm not like the, as a friend of mine says, I'm not the sharpest tool in the box. So I had to go to the dictionary. And this is the dictionary's definition of an atheist. It says, a person who does not believe in the existence of a God or any gods, one who subscribes, one who subscribes to or advocates atheism. So here it is, and when we define an atheist, it says someone who does not believe a God or any gods, but I was like, okay, so that's what the dictionary says, but is there a deeper definition? So I went to another definition. This is actually from the American Atheist website, and this is what they have to say about an atheist. They said, atheism is not an affirmative belief that there is no God, nor does it answer any question about what a person believes. It is simply a rejection of the assertion that there are gods. Atheism said, listen, there are no gods. I'm not going to say, like, you know, I don't believe in that, but I just say there's no gods. Now, notice what he says. Atheism is too often defined incorrectly as a belief system. To be clear, atheism is not a disbelief in gods or a denial of gods. It is a lack of belief in gods. I'll be honest, I don't really understand all of what that meant. But all I know is what they are saying is, we do not believe in God. That's, that's their, their definition. So if I was to say, listen, atheism is, is not believing in God, just know you didn't take it from me, you took it from them. Atheism is not believing in God. Our subject tonight is an atheist Christian. You know, the Bible talks about atheism. The Bible actually says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, it talks about uh, the idea of, of the prophecy that is actually dealing with France, and it talks about how uh, this city was, was part Egypt, is like Egypt and Sodom. Well, why Sodom? Well, Sodom because of all the sodomy that happened in, in France. But the Bible actually refers to the idea of Egypt because Pharaoh said what? Who is this Jehovah that I should obey him? He said, I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. And so France, we understand, they wanted to remove God. And so the Bible was prophesying of atheism. 
We see other ideas where the Bible talks about atheism. In Romans chapter 1, we can kind of get an understanding of that, even though we see that there's also nature worship, um, probably more deism. But we see these ideas in the Bible of atheism. But I want to share with you tonight that if there was ever a definition of atheism that we can go to, I believe it's in Psalm chapter 15. Go with me in your Bible. I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 14. Psalm chapter 14, we're still looking at what does the Bible say about atheism as we look at this idea of the atheist Christian. Go with me in your Bible, Psalm chapter 14, and notice what the Bible says in verse 1. Psalm chapter 14 and verse 1. And the Bible says this, the fool hath said in his heart, what everyone? There is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It says they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. No, it says none that doeth good. It says the Lord looked down from heaven and upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. So the Bible here gives an idea of atheism uh, in, this, in, this, in this passage. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's what the atheist says. He says, look, there is no God. But notice here in the passage that the, the person here doesn't say it with his lips. He says it with his heart. So that outwardly he can actually look like he's a Christian. Outwardly he can actually look like he's serving God, but the way that you know that this person is saying that he's a fool in his heart is through his actions. His actions show whether or not he really believes there's a God. The atheist Christian. So I started really thinking about this, this thought. How do I know what ways can I become an atheist Christian? What ways can I say in my heart there's no God? And what I discovered from the Bible is there's three ways. There's three ways you and I can possibly say there's no God. Go with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, if you remember in Matthew chapter 24, we see that God gives us, Jesus gives us some illustrations. And what we're going to notice about these illustrations tonight, uh, at Matthew chapter 24, let's look at verse 37. Now, let me ask you a question. We know that the Bible actually talks about, the, about Moses. We know the Bible actually, or I'm sorry, Noah. And we know that Noah preached. Now, how long did Noah preach? Can anyone tell me? 120 years. So, and then after 120 years, Noah ends up going into the ark. Can anyone tell me how old was his son, were his sons when they, when they went into the ark? Roughly. Uh, when they went into the ark? I believe the Bible says they're about 100 years old. So Noah preached for 120 years. They're roughly about 100 years old when they go into the ark. What does that tell you about Noah's sons? They were born while Noah was preaching. All right, we understand that? Now, when Noah's sons went into the ark, were they single or were they married? They were married. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Notice what the Bible says here in verse 37. It says, I'm sorry, I'm chapter 25, chapter 24, 37. Let's begin in verse 36. It says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So when we read this passage, we're like, wow. When Jesus looks at this, this or Jesus points out this passage, and he says, when Noah, in the days of Noah, when they went into the ark, he said, well, why were they not ready for, for the flood? It says they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage. So we say, well, wait a minute. Didn't Noah's sons get married during that time? Didn't they go into the ark? So there was something that kept these people out of the ark. It wasn't just the idea that marriage, there was something wrong with marriage, but there was something that was distracting them from getting inside the ark. Go with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 6. And we're looking at the idea of what is an atheist Christian. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. 
And we're going to look at verse, begin at verse 1. Are we there? All right. Notice what the Bible says. It said, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. And then Jesus says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Here we find that the Bible shows us that the reason that God had a problem with man, it says because the sons of God started to look at the daughters of man, and it said they took them wise of all which God chose. It was all which they chose. What I want to share with you tonight, the first reason that we can live like an atheist Christian, or we can live like there is no God, is when we live as though God has no say in our lives. It's just that simple. We can live as though God has no say in our, in our lives. I remember the, uh, when I was, um, I told you about how I actually came to school here, but I remember when I, when I was in high school, I always thought I knew what I was going to do uh, for school. And so, you know, I, I had different ideas, but I knew what, where, what school I wanted to go to. <clears throat> but as I started getting close to high school, or the end of high school, I started thinking to myself, well, what am I going to do uh, for school? I was so confused. It seems like um, everyone else knew what they were doing. And by the way, this is an interesting thing I learned about high school. Everyone, like as an individual, you always think everyone, er everyone else knows what they're doing but you. But here's the thing, your friends, they also think everyone else knows what they're doing but themselves. Everyone's in the same boat, and so we're, but we're always looking, comparing, oh, it seems like so-and-so, oh, it seems like he knows what he's doing, I'm the, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm so depressed, I'm so... But guess what, we're all in the same boat, generally, not everyone, but generally speaking. But that was me. I got to the point, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I started thinking, you know what, I want to go to a school, but guess how I made my decision? Where are all my friends going? Now I wanted to do some, I wanted to be a Christian a little bit. I was praying. I was like, well, Lord, I want to go to a Christian school now. You know, I, I, and I'll share a little bit about that later. But I was thinking to myself, I want to go to a Christian school now. I want my life to change a little bit. But you know what? I kind of want to have fun too. I kind of want to just go where all my friends are going. Let me tell you something. That was the worst decision I could make. My spiritual life just plummeted. I was not seeking God. I was not really going to God, going to his word, and saying, Lord, how can I make my decisions? I was living as though God had no say in my life. You know, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of, of, of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What it doesn't say is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then add on those things you like. No, it says all the things. God knows what we need. He, look, he even knows the social needs we have. And sometimes we get to the point where we think like, well, Lord, if I'm around this group, then I have friends. God knows our social needs. I'll say this and I'll move on. Do you know one of the reasons why I didn't want to become a Christian? It was tough for me to become a Christian. Because I thought I have no friends. When I gave that to God, when I sought God first, I've had more friends since I've been a Christian than I've ever had before I, was a, before I gave my life to Christ. More for I have brothers and sisters all over in other, other countries when I gave myself to Christ. But here's the thing. We oftentimes think that God's not wise enough. So we're like, well, when it comes to this, well, we'll leave God out the picture. It's like we don't even think about God. Notice what the Bible says in Psalm 10. I want to share this, this passage with you. In Psalm chapter, well, the, the 10th division of Psalm, as they would say. And notice what the Bible says in verse 4. Are we there? The Bible says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. And notice what it says. God is not in all his thoughts. He lives as though there is no God, like God has no say in his life. And that's the first way we can live, as though there is no God. It's not outwardly saying, oh, boy, I denounce God, but inwardly do consult God when it comes to our decisions. The second way we can live as though there is no God is that we can live as though God cannot save. Go with me in your Bible to Numbers chapter 13. We're probably familiar with this story. 
In Numbers chapter 13, if you remember the children of Israel, they are camped um, based or close to the Jordan, I believe at this time. They send, they, this is the point where they send spies into, the, the, into uh, the land of Canaan. And for 40 days, they spy out the land. If you remember that story. And by the way, we're told that it wasn't necessarily God's will for them to do that, but because they wanted it, God says, okay, let them spy it out. So they send 12 spies into the land. They, they spy out the land. They actually come back with a good report, and that should have strengthened their faith because God had promised them that he would, they would go to a land flowing with milk and honey. He promised that he would bless them. And so when they saw it, they came back with, originally with a somewhat good report. They were like, wow, you know, the grapes are like this. It's beautiful. It truly is a land flowing with milk and honey. But then they start to look at something else. Notice what the Bible says, Psalm, or Numbers 13, beginning of verse 31. And it says this, but, these are the ten spies. It says, but the men that went up with him, this is talking about went up with Caleb, we be not able to, uh, said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone up to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants. So they start even making up. They just, they at first, it was like, oh, it's like these beautiful grapes, these cluster of grapes. The land is really nice. It flows with milk and honey. And then Caleb, and then they said, but the land is, we can't go up and fight. And Caleb and Joshua was like, look, we can go up and fight. Let's go take the land right away. And then in order for them to convince the people not to do it, they start telling the people, you know, the land eats up the inhabitants. Wait a minute, you just said they were giants. Now you're going to make a false report. They're starting trying to convince the people. Watch what happens next. It says, then they continue, or the Bible continues. It says, is a land that eateth the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that saw, saw in it are, we saw in it, are men of a great statue. And they, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Notice here, they were, they were really looking at the idea, saying, look, we can't go into to face these giants. We cannot go in to take uh, the land because they were looking at themselves. They were looking at the circumstances. But notice what the Bible says in Numbers chapter 14, verse 7. This is Joshua now. And it says, and they spake unto all, this is Caleb and Joshua, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the, this land and give it us. And a land, a land which floweth with milk and honey, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Here's two different groups here. One group, they were saying, listen, we can't go fight. We can't do this. They're too big for us. But Caleb and Joshua said, listen. Don't rebel against the Lord. If the Lord delights in us, we can take the land. Something I want to share with you is that oftentimes we live as though there's no God that can save us. We live as though there's no God that's powerful enough to deliver us out of the circumstances. And the reason that we do that is because we look more to the circumstances to the power of our God. This is why we talked the other two couple of nights ago about how faith is so important. We must believe that our God is powerful. And let me tell you something. If ever you're struggling to believe in the power of God, I want to suggest something. Have your devotions on the power of God. Read stories that talk about the power of God because it will strengthen your faith. They were too busy dwelling upon the circumstances instead of the power of God. And they lived like God could not even save. Like there's no God that exists that can save us out of these circumstances. How do we live like atheist Christians? There's another reason that I want to talk about tonight, and I believe this is the one that really impressed my mind. Those are some of the things you could probably think of other reasons we can talk about or other reasons that come to your mind like, oh boy, you know, when I look at that situation, I live like there's no God. But there's another reason I think is so vitally important that I believe we can apply even today. Go with me in your Bible to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. 
And we're going to look at verse 7. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. Notice what the Bible says there. Are we there? Amen. And the Bible says, Psalm 39, verse 7. It says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. What is the Bible saying here? What the Bible is simply saying is, there is no place you can go where the presence of God cannot see you. There's no place you can go where there is, where, 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 where you will not have the presence of God. But the problem is simply this. We oftentimes forget that. We oftentimes forget that God's presence is everywhere. And you say, well, what is the effect? When we forget that God's presence is there, what does that do to us in our walk with Christ? Let me give you some illustrations. How many of you remember the story of Achan? Remember the story of Achan? Like, what, what happened in that story? We all know that the story of Achan, um, of course, by the way, no one knew that he had, except probably his family, that he had stole these Babylonian garments after the, the fall of Jericho, he hid those Babylonian garments, he puts it, he hides it underneath his tent. And um, so then Israel, they're like, look, we just, by the way, it was, they were a little overconfident, right? And so they're thinking like, look, we're going to go and we're going to, oh man, we just got through destroying Ai, I mean, uh, Jericho, let's go take Ai. And so they go to fight little old Ai, and to their dismay, Ai turns them around and they flee back. I think a few of them die. And they're like, and Joshua's like, what just happened? And you have to understand the reason why Joshua was, was feeling this way is because Joshua or Israel had just had a powerful revival. I mean, it wasn't like they were just like living any kind of way. They actually had a powerful revival. If you look at the history of what happened to Israel prior to this point, they had the whole situation of, uh, of, of the Balaam situation. And, 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 you know, they had that revival there. Many people, if you remember, it was a horrible story, but many people died. And Israel's like, look, we need to repent and get back to God. Following that, they come to the Jordan, and they cross the the Jordan River. They see how God just opens up the way for them, and then they walk around the the Jericho seven days. On the last day, they walk around seven days, and the walls come tumbling down. They, they, They were having, like, if ever Israel was ready to be used by God, it was at this time. What is the point I'm trying to make? If you were sitting next to Achan, you remember that time when they started having the, the judgment started to, they started going through casting lots? If you were standing next to Achan, you would have never known that Achan was the one. Achan was living at a time where Israel was having a revival. But in his heart, he hid something and he forgot that God had saw him. He was living like an atheist Christian while outwardly he was living like he was serving God. How about the story of David? Remember David? High time of his kingdom. They're battling. They're winning all these battles. And suddenly David, he's like, wow, you know, I'll leave my generals out there. I'll go home. He goes home. And what does he see? Looking off of his roof, he sees a woman out there. You know the story. don't have to go into the details. He tries to cover the whole story up. He tries to cover the whole thing up. And, and for a time, I'm sure some people knew, but for a time, it looked like he was covering it up. But then we see Nathan the prophet come to him, tells him this story. Uh, uh, David is convicted. He's like, look, who's this man? And, and Nathan the prophet, with boldness, could you imagine, says, look, thou art the man. David had forgotten while he was looking like he was a Christian. While he was looking like everyone was like, wow, this powerful king for God, he had forgotten that God had seen him. But he looked outwardly like a Christian. 
he had forgotten. There was another time in the New Testament. How about Ananias and Sapphira? Remember them? The New Testament Christians, the Holy Spirit had just been poured out. They were having these powerful revivals. They were preaching. They were preaching in tongues and all these different amazing things were happening. People's hearts were so convicted and, and so moved. They were bringing gifts to the church. And Ananias and Sapphira, they're like, look, we're moved too. We're going to bring our gifts. And then they decide, well, wait a minute. No one will know if we don't bring all our gifts. We'll keep some back for us. They bring the gifts, come to Peter. And Peter's like, Ananias, is this, is this everything? He's like, oh, absolutely. Struck down on the spot. This fire comes in, gives her a chance. She lies like her husband. And he says, the men who took out your husband will take out you too. She dies on the spot. But wait a minute. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, they would have looked like Christians like everybody else. But in their hearts, they forgot that God saw everything. They were living like atheist Christians. Let me say, well, is, there, is there any hope? <laughs> Are there any experiences where people actually lived like God exists? Well, there's one story that really comes to my mind that really encourages me. It's the story of Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph? Let's go in our Bibles here to uh, Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 39, verse, beginning of verse 7. Are we there? All right. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and he said, Lie with me. But he refused. And he said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in, in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Here it is. Joseph was a servant. Potiphar's wife, of course, she has authority over him. And she, she, she's pursuing Joseph, and it's almost like, look, no one sees Joseph. And she, she didn't even give up. She was relentless. She would come back. And you think to yourself, Joseph was a young man. Potiphar's wife, she probably wasn't that bad looking. Why didn't he just give in? Why didn't he just, like, no one would have known. But his answer said it all. He says, how can I do this wickedness and sin against God? And it was this motivation that led Joseph later in verse 11. And it says, it came to pass about the time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, that there was none of the men of the house there, there within, that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out. Because Joseph had this mindset that, look, if I do this, I'm sinning against God. When temptation came on him, he was like, look, I'm getting out of there. He was able to overcome. And it was this story that really, really began to impress my mind. You know, when I was, bef before I, uh, I didn't grow up, by the way, my parents didn't grow up with video games in, the home, in, in my home. But occasionally I would go and, and play video games at my uncle's house or play video games at friends' houses. And so as soon as I got the chance, I was like, you know what? I'm getting video games. Oh, man, I, I played a lot of different games and spent hours doing this and bought more. And as I got more into it, the games I, I played, they got worse and worse. But when I gave my heart to God, I was like, you know what? That slowly reversed. I can't say I just got rid of it all at the same time, but it slowly reversed. I got rid of some of the worst ones first. I kind of was left with, like, you know, some of the, the sports games. But I still noticed that it was taking up my time. I still noticed that it was distracting me. And to my shame, even when I was first started Bible working, I was still playing some of these games. They weren't the ones that people say were really bad, but I was like, these are things that are taking up my time. So the Lord convicted me before I came to, to school at Washtenaw Hills. I was like, you know what? I'm getting rid of this stuff. Getting rid of it. 
First year went by, had no problem. Second year, year went by, had no problem. And I can remember it was one summer I was canvassing in Kansas. And I remember they had just came out with this new game and I happened to see it. And I was like, wow. It was like one of those type of things that uh, for me, I always thought, boy, that would be nice if you had a game out like that and suddenly come out with it. And here I am, I'm on this canvassing trip. I'm a leader. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I would really want to get that game. Ah, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't play that. I know it's going to take up my time. I know it's going to distract me from Jesus. But I really want to get that. Here's the thing. No one else knows I'm struggling with this. Because outside to everyone else, I look like I'm a Christian. Outside, man, when we're, it's time to go out, praying with everybody else. But in my heart, I was thinking, I want to get that game. Weekends would come. You know how on weekends you get a chance to sometimes go out and do different things? Boy, I happened to walk into the store that had that game. I was like, there it is. I want it. No, I can't do that. I'm on a canvassing trip. Besides, I don't play that anymore. But I really want it. It began to get so possessed of me, like I'd be thinking about it. I'm like, man, like what is wrong with me? I'm thinking about wanting this game. So one day in the summer, I actually had a break. I had a break to, you know, it was, it was my weekend or my day off, so to speak. And it's like, well, we kind of, we try to adjust who's going to go out, what, you, what have you. And so I was like, well, I'm going to stay back at school and by myself. I had my car there. And I started thinking, that game. I should go get it. Nobody would know. I could play it, put it away. No one would ever know. That's not right. No, no one would ever know. And so I was deciding to go out and do this. I actually think I left the school. I went down to the store. And I was thinking about this, like, no, I can't do it. Driving back home, I was like, this is the chance. You should get it. Nobody would know. But then the thought came to my mind, a quote came to my mind that I want to read to you. This quote came to my mind, speaking about Joseph. Ellen White says, this is in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 217. She said, Joseph's answer, speaking about him running from Potiphar's wife, reveals the power of religious principle. He would not betray the confidence of his master on earth, and whatsoever, whatever the consequences, he would be true to his master in heaven. Under the inspecting eye of God and holy angels, many take liberties of which they would not be guilty in the presence of their fellow men. I didn't want anyone else to see me playing this game. No one saw me, but I forgot that God was watching. For a moment, I did. But then she continues. She says, um, but Joseph's first thought was of God. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God, he said. Notice what she says next. This was the quote. If we were to cherish a habitual impression that God sees and hears all that we do and say and keeps a faithful record our words and, of our words and actions and that, they, that we must meet it all, we would fear to sin. It was that quote that came to my mind. And I was like, listen, I want the presence of God. If no one else sees me, God sees me, and I do not want to forfeit his presence. And I was like, Lord, you got to help me right now. I never bought that game. Praise God. I can't ever tell you, I would not sit here and tell you that there was not moments in other experiences where I've been to people's houses and they're playing a game. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's interesting to look at it. But I don't play it. Because I know that I have to live as though I'm in the eyes of God. There was a lady, a uh, Bible study contact, she used to always tell me, she's like, who you are when you're alone is who you really are. And I believe there's so many of us, we're living like atheist Christians. We live as though when we're alone, no one sees us and we forget that God sees everything. There's things that we do secretly on the internet 
There's these things we do, maybe it's not secretly, but with this bunch of friends, we might speak a certain way. We might use a certain language because we're like, oh, we're not around the Christian friends now. Those Christian friends won't see what I'm doing right now. But God still sees. God still sees. And what God wants to encourage us to do is to develop a habit or the habitual mindset that his presence, that he, that he is always present, that his presence is always near. Before I close, I want to share with you what are some things that have helped me? What are some things that have helped, has helped me? You know, the first thing that's helped me to have a habitual mindset of God's presence is to learn how to meditate on God day and night. To meditate on God day and night. A lot of times we end our devotions and then we're like, well, devotions are done. I'm not thinking about it anymore. No, I want to encourage you. When you have your devotions, think about it throughout your day. Find times to think about it or think about something about God because it's that meditation on God that helps you be reminded that God's presence is near. The other thing is I like to pray. I like to pray to God, even if I'm, no matter what I'm doing, I could be like out working. I'm like, man, you know, I, I literally talk to God, like, if I'm fixing something, Lord, this is, for, this is difficult. Lord, you got to help me with this. Like, I talk to God because what I want is I want God's presence near. You have to do things that remind yourself that God's presence is near. And then the other thing I saw that was very valuable, I believe it's very valuable. That, taught, that really taught me how to, how to use this imagination of mine to believe that God's presence is near. By the way, I don't think we often realize the, the value and the use of the imagination. We have, Satan has so polluted our imagination that we use our imagination for the wrong thing. We kind of give our imagination to other men to use. So when a movie comes out, we give our imaginations over, and Satan's like, look, I can use your imagination for what I want it. But you know what God's real intent for our imagination was? Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever been to heaven? None of us. How many of you have ever thought about heaven and its beauties? That's what your imagination is used for. How many of you know what it's like to be in the presence of God? How many of you have thought about being in the presence of God? That's what your imagination is used for. But these practical things too. But one of the things I realized is that practicing holiness in God's presence helps me to understand and, and imagine being in God's presence when I'm not in, in, a, in a holy place. What I mean by that is this. When I come to church, you know, there's a certain reverence God wants us to have. I remember... Um, going to a gentleman's church. I didn't actually really realize I was going to his church. I thought I was just going to a little group meeting uh, that happened to be at his church. I didn't know I was going to a service. And a guy stayed on my street, and he was always like, hey, you know, we talked about God. And he was like, I want you to come. We have a group thing. It's on Monday night. And I was like, okay. And I went to this meeting, and I, I took my Bible. So I was obviously to church. You know, we're going to go probably talk about God. You know, I took my Bible. And he, we get there. And we go into the church, and when I get to the church, it was one of those type of churches. In fact, the, the, the name of the church was called, well, I shouldn't give the name of the church. Um, but it was one of those type of churches where it was like, come as you are. And I didn't know it was kind of like that. And, and so people came in, they, you know, they wore whatever they wanted to wear. Um, they were just in, in this, when they went to the sanctuary, everyone was kind of like, hey, how you doing? You know, just, I mean, it was just, everyone was having a good time. They had like a food court outside, so people brought their cotton candy inside the church, brought their popcorn inside the church. You know, the music started playing. Everyone's up and going around, and people just kind of fellowshipping and hanging out. And I really didn't feel the idea that I was in the presence of God. And something that really struck me, I didn't tell you, is that before I went into church, my friend said to me, he's like, everyone's going to know you're not from here. I'm like, really? I said, why is that? He's like, you're going to be the only one with the Bible. No one brings Bibles here. I was like, whoa. This book, to me, is the word of God. And to discard it, like, how do you get to the point where you can discard it? Well, in my mind, I was like, there has to be something that's connected with discarding the word of God and treating his presence like it's just a, another common event. 
when I go into God's presence, I learn when I learn to be holy and reverent, I get a picture of what it's like to be in God's presence. You know, that helps me. That helps me because I'm, I'm learning to imagine what God's presence is like. So that when I'm not there and I'm, I'm praying or I'm, I'm getting this concept, I'm like, Lord, you are really here. I really can believe that you're here. I can talk to you. I can pray to you because I'm learning. God has given us, given us a precious tool to help us, though he's not physically here, to learn how to live in his presence. When we're, when we're reverencing God, when we're, going, when we're imagining his presence, when we're in, in his holy presence, it helps us. But when we don't have that, we start to live like God doesn't exist. We start to live like, oh, we can do what we want. We go into God's church. The Bible can easily become less important to us. We've got to live like God exists. It benefits us to live as though God exists and not as an atheist Christian. There was a story. This is a true story. A friend of mine, he's an older gentleman, he told me this story. And he heard it from some gentlemen that were older than he was. But it was back in the 1940s, I believe it was, um, during World War II, 1941, 42, somewhere around there. And uh, during that time in Tennessee, there was a place called Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they were helping to put together the atomic bomb. I actually visited a museum in Tennessee that was showed how the places look and what they would do. But they were there in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but there was, uh, in, in order to have their factories or whatever they needed there, they needed to bring a whole lot of other people there to do other sorts of things, build homes, and there was various things they needed to do. So in order to build homes, they obviously need to have the, the, the material to build homes. So they had to go and get like some, some sawmills and different things of that nature. So they had to go to places where they had the wood. So the government at the time, if you if you remember in the 40s, it was still around the time of the, of the Depression <clears throat> during this time. And people were looking for jobs, obviously. And there was this gentleman who was hired by the government to go to Washington to start a sawmill to get wood to ship down to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And so when he went to, um, to Washington, uh, he went to this certain... He, he went to this really, really small town, walks in a small town. The town was so small that their postal service and their grocery store was the same. So he goes over to the grocery store, and he's looking for the manager, who's also the head of the, the, the post office. So he's looking for the manager, but he comes in. He notices that the manager is talking to this woman, and she has one, one child. She's holding one child, and the other little child is kind of roaming around the store. And so the man, it was a hot day, he just kind of comes in, instead of bothering the, the manager, he's just kind of waiting, and he just looks in the store, and as he's looking in the store, he watches this little kid, and this little kid uh, is sort of roaming around the store, and as he's roaming around the store, he gets across to this huge basket of blackberries, juicy blackberries. Now, I don't know if you ever had blackberries, or how many of you ever picked blackberries? I picked blackberries. Uh, something you know about picking blackberries, now, I could... I've learned how to pick black blackberries where they're good and nice and juicy. Um, but they also have thorns on them. The ones I picked had thorns. But these were blackberries in a basket. They didn't have thorns. And this kid, he's roaming around the store, and he comes across, he gets across to this, this big basket of blackberries. And they were like two cents, however many, I don't know if it was a pound or ounces or whatever it was. But he's looking at these blackberries, and he's just staring, and the man saw the child looking at the blackberries. And he's thinking, he wants one of those blackberries. And the kid says, no. He just leaves, he goes running, roaming around the store again. And as he's roaming around the store, he comes back around to those blackberries, and this time he looks at those blackberries, he's like, he wants to pick one. And he's like, no, 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 the little kid, he just runs, he leaves the, the blackberries. He's about, he's about five or six years old. Leaves the blackberries. But then he comes back and he's looking at those blackberries. That man says, boy, before, before this day is over, one of those blackberries are gonna be, is going to be gone. Kid never picks up a blackberry. Finally, the kid comes around and he looks at those blackberries. And this time, it just looks like, oh, boy, he wants it. So he's reaching out his hand. He looks like he's about to take that blackberry. And that man's watching. And suddenly, the kid says, stop, Satan. And he runs over to his mother. And he just clings to his mom. Clings to his mom. 
The man starts laughing. Finally, the lady leaves. The man goes up to the store manager and says, boy, you almost lost a Blackberry today. And the man said, oh, really? He said, what do you mean? He says, that little kid, I saw him. He was running around here, and he was looking for, he was wanting one of those black Blackberries. He almost got one of those Blackberries. Then he said, stop Satan. He ran to his mom. He said, can you believe that? He said, oh, boy, that's so funny. And the man said, you know what? I wasn't going to lose a Blackberry today. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, are you talking about that little kid with that lady? He said, oh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. And those Seventh-day Adventists are the honest people in town, the most honest people in town. The man said, really? So he said, uh, where can I find these Seventh-day Adventists? And he says, well, it's Wednesday night, so you can go over to their church, and you can, um, you can go over there. He told me, he said, I'm, I'm looking for people to hire. So he goes over to their church, and while he's in their church, he waits until the, the whole meeting was over. He gets up. He says, listen, I'm in town. I'm trying to start a sawmill. I heard about you all, and, and um, basically tells them, he said, look, I'm looking for people who need work. Over half the men in the church were out of jobs. They raised their hand. He's like, okay, I'll take you, 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 you. They come. They all get jobs during the Depression time, and they had work. Well, years later, my friend, he had heard this story from someone else. He tells this story in Washington for a children's story. And as he's telling this story, some of the men that were there that day stand up and like, that was me. I remember that. Another man said, yeah, I was there too. And about two or three men stood up and said, look, we were there. That really did happen. And so my friend asked and they said, he said, um, do you know who the boy was? And they said, till this day, we do not know who that boy was. But because that boy lived as though God was watching, and he would not pick a blackberry, till this day we are appreciative we all had jobs during the Depression. Our families were able to eat because one boy decided he would not eat a blackberry. My friends, you don't know. I don't know the blessing we could be for somebody else because we choose to live as though we're in the presence of God. We have to develop that habitual habit of saying, Lord, I know I'm in your presence. When we're alone, when we're secret, in the secret, God is still watching. God has to be real with us. Tonight, my prayer is that God becomes real with all of us. And I pray that that's your prayer too tonight. And I just want to ask tonight, if your desire is that God would be real in your life, if you want to make that dedication, Lord, be more real in my life. I'm going to ask you to stand with me tonight. If that's your desire. Amen. God honors. God sees. He sees when we make decisions for him. And I want to pray with you tonight. And then as always, I want to ask that we would get into groups and quietly pray together and, and then quietly leave um, once you're done. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for your strength, for your help, but also I thank you that you can, you've given us counsel, Lord, how we can live in your presence, how we can overcome those secret sins. Lord, there are things that men have done, women have done, when they thought they were alone, if they only realized that your presence was right there. Lord, they would shun sin, but not only would they shun sin, but they would cling to you. Father, I pray this will be our experience that you will become more real in our lives. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Washington Hills College and Academy. If you've enjoyed the programs just as much as I did, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.